now we are second presentation. Uh, Eduardo Torto is speaking about the paradoxical form of creative practice, exploring the less theory of time in logical sense. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what I'm planning on saying has changed a little bit in my abstract, but not enough that I need to change the title, I don't think. Um, it's still about creativity in the it's about creativity and the work and how it's related to his theory of time in a logical sense. So, <clears throat> creativity is a vital force in Deleuze's work. For Deleuze, truly creative practices are neither representational nor predetermined. They do not reflect the world or appear as service effects or the phenomena on the world. Instead, they take part in the very genesis of experience and in the genesis of the world as it is experienced. Artworks do not reflect reality, they take part in its fabulation. Deleuze's philosophy is one in which radical novelty is possible. Art does not simply create new interpretations of the world, but new worlds. Art is also given an internal quality by Deleuze. When discussing the relationship between the artwork and its material sub substance sorry, in what is philosophy, Deleuze and Guattari state the following, quote, even if the material lasts only for a few seconds, it will give sensation the power to exist and be preserved in itself in the eternity that coexists with this short duration. So long as the material lasts, the sensation enjoys an eternity in those very moments. Sensation is not realized in the material without the material passing completely into the sensation." End quote. But how is this all possible? How can it be that art does not come after the world as it is experienced, but before? How can it be that art has the power to lend eternity to sensation? In order to shed some light on these problems, I believe that it's instructive to go back to the metaphysical work that Deleuze produced before his collaborations with Guattari. Specifically, it's useful to return to the theories of time that he develops there. So for this purpose, we could turn to either different, different repetition or the logical sense, in each of which Deleuze develops a theory of time that opens not only the possibility of radical creativity of the sort I've just mentioned, but it's necessity. Now in this paper I've chosen to discuss the logical sense, in which Deleuze defines two different forms of time, the two forms he names Aeon and Kronos. This afternoon I'll, I will first attempt to explain how De Deleuze distinguishes these two forms of time in the logical sense, and to show the work that each of them performs in the metaphysics he constructs there. In the second section of the paper I will then attempt to use these two forms of time to give one example of how it's possible for art to partake in this genesis of reality. To do this, I'll draw on two of the literary references made by Deleuze in the logical sense. First, I'll consider the use of portmanteau words in the paradoxical writings of the logician and novelist Lewis Carroll. I will then turn to the use of what Deleuze calls power words and breath words in the intense bodily productions of the poet and dramatist Antonin Artaud. Now, strangely, actually, I have recognized quite a lot of uh, resonances how uh, this, earlier on today the work of um, Bacon being discussed and now God, I have their work could equally be discussed in this context, I think. But I'm going to stick with the logical sense. In the logical sense, Deleuze attempts to describe the process of genesis that gives rise to the extended structure of our experienced reality. For Deleuze, that which is extended in space and time is the result of an intensive genetic process. In the logic of sense, space and time are not taken as preconditions for the genesis of the experienced world. This genesis does not happen in space and in time. But instead, the spatio-temporal conditions of experience are generated simultaneously alongside experience. Deleuze describes the logic of sense as a logical and psychological novel, which tells the story of the genesis of the subject of experience. He doesn't quite tell it in, in, in this way, but I'm kind of reconstructing the narrative. The narrative begins in, in a pre-individual realm, in which there is no separation between subjects and objects, or between bodies and worlds, and ends with the structured world of our spatio-temporally defined existence, in which subjects and objects are clearly distinguished, and in which words and bodies are kept at a safe distance from one another. This story has two different stages, each of which generates its own temporal conditions leaving Deleuze with two distinct forms of time. The first process that Deleuze describes begins with the pre-individual field. 
Deleuze names this undifferentiated, chaotic mass of bodies, sounds, and sensations the primary order. While never experienced directly, the primary order is approached in the experience of young children before the production of subjectivity, and also by schizophrenics in the depths of psychosis. In the primary order, everything is present. Nothing is recollected from the past, and nothing expected of the future. For this reason, the primary order can be said to have no temporal organization. Deleuze describes the depths that characterize this primary order of direct experiences, of direct experience, sorry, as being full of intensities. He writes, quote, sounds, smells, tastes, and temperatures refer especially to the emissions from the depths. As we approach the primary order, these intensities are experienced immediately and indeterminately in one simultaneous disordered block. The first form of time that Deleuze will describe is generated by the way in which these intensities become distinct and separate from one another. To explain this process, Deleuze takes the example of temperature, but in my mind he could equally have taken sound, taste, or even color. And again there, as I say, he could have discussed bacon, I think, or got out of this context. But here I'm looking at temperature. He says that if we ask the question, quote, why water changes its state of quality at zero degrees centigrade, then the question is poorly stated insofar as zero degrees is considered as an ordinary point on the thermometer. If it is considered on the contrary as a singular point, it is inseparable from the event occurring at that point, always being zero in relation to its realization on the line of ordinary points, always forthcoming and already past. So zero degrees can be understood not as a point on the scale, but as a singularity, as nothing but the infinitely divisible threshold or tipping point which separates water that is solid from water that is liquid. And as such, it refers only to that which is in a process of freezing, or that which is in a process of melting. The key point to recognize here is that intensities, such as temperatures, sounds, smells, and tastes, and potentially colors, are not defined as points on a scale, but as thresholds at which transformations occur. Intensities constantly subdivide themselves. At zero degrees centigrade, water is constantly subdividing itself into a liquid on one side and a solid on the other. This constant process of subdivision, in which the two sides of the intensive difference are separated out from one another, is also the process by which the intensities of the primary order become distinct from one another. Deleuze named this process of subdivision and separation the secondary organization. This process generates the first of the two forms of time that I previously mentioned. In the secondary organization of experience, each moment of experience, is, or an event, is a threshold that constantly subdivides itself. Deleuze calls these moments events. Events follow the same logic as intensities. The present is never experienced in itself. All that is experienced is the splitting of the past from the future. Thus, the temporal structure of the secondary organization has a past and a future, but no present. Deleuze, Deleuze names this form of time the ion. Quote, in accordance with ion, only the past and future inhere or subsist in time. Instead of a present that absorbs the past and future, a future and past divide the present at every instant and subdivide it ad infinitum into past and future in both directions at once. So the second stage of this story that Deleuze describes moves us from this secondary organization to the structure of a fully individuated experience. In this process, the aeonic temporal structure that I've just described of constant subdivision gives rise to a new extended temporal structure in which each present moment of experience is given an ordered position relative to all others. As any event serves to separate out that which is on either side of it, these two sides can, be, can then be given a position relative to one another. Each past moment can be considered as a previous present moment, and each future moment can be considered as a present moment yet to come. The subject of experience, who is also produced in this genesis, experiences each of these units as a series of present moments, such that the experience of the subject is one which moves from one present to the next, never experiencing either past or future. Deleuze names this ordered experience of a series of present moments the tertiary order. This is the structure of the lived experience of the normal, non-psychotic adult, whose ego has been successfully separated out from the depths of the unconscious and who is now able to maintain a stable separation between the interiority of subjectivity and the exteriority of the world of objects. As the secondary organization of intensive differences generated the aeonic form of time with the past and future but no present, the tertiary order now also generates its own temporal conditions, which Deleuze names chronos. Under this new chronological temporal structure, experience is organized into a series of ordered presents which all coexist simultaneously. To quote, in accordance with chronos, 
Only the present exists in time. Past, present, and future are not three dimensions of time. Only the present fills time, whereas past and future are two dimensions relative to the present in time. In other words, whatever is future or past in relation to a certain present, a certain extension or duration, belongs to a more vast present, which has a greater extension or duration. So we've now been through these two stages of Deleuze's narrative, in which we move from the unmediated intensities of the depths through a process of division towards an extended temporal structure of lived experience. We've also seen that the two different stages of this process produce two different forms of time, aeon and chronos, the first of which conditions the genesis of the extended reality, while the second conditions the experience of this extended reality. These two forms of time are distinct from one another. They are generated in different processes and they condition different levels of reality. So to quote Deleuze, we have seen that past, present, and future were not, were not at all three parts of a single temporality, but that they, but that they rather formed two readings of time, each one of which is complete and excludes the other. Aeonic time is generated from the depths of the primary order of experience, it splits past from future and defines the process by which the subject is split from the object and by which bodies are separated from words. In the time of Chronos, on the other hand, the past and future are never experienced. They are replaced instead by a series of order present moments which follow one another and in which subjects and objects are always experienced as fully distinct and in which words and bodies form two different series ordered in parallel with one another. <clears throat> okay, so that's my attempt to go through the two different forms of time and logical set in five minutes. So in section two, the work of art and its generative power in the logical sense. So how does this all relate to art and to creativity? I've been trying to answer the question of how an artwork can in some sense be eternal, and also how it can be non-representational. In the analysis of time I've just presented, it is the aeonic event that points us in the right direction. The event separates the past from the future, but is not located at any particular point in the resulting linear time that it gives rise to. It has the form of an intensity like zero degrees. It is an abstract, singular, and eternal point that defines a threshold. The creativity we are trying to define here must have a similar form to this aeonic event. While the event separates the past from the future, and zero degrees separates out two different states of water, the creation of an artwork must separate out two states of experience, or two states of reality, what we might call content and expression, or what Deleuze in logical sense normally refers to as bodies and words. Lewis Carroll's writing is interesting for Deleuze because of the way in which it deals with nonsense and with paradox. I don't have time to run through everything Deleuze has to say about paradox, which is most of the book, really. Um, but I'll just take one example of the technique used by Carroll that Deleuze finds particularly, particularly productive, namely his use of portmanteau words. So a portmanteau is a word produced by combining two other words. The example we'll take here is fruminous, as it appears in Carroll's nonsense poem, The Jabberwocky, which is a combination of the words fuming and furious. Deleuze quotes Carroll's own explanation of the relationship between the two words that make up the portmanteau. The quote, to quote Deleuze, quoting Carroll. If your thoughts incline ever so little towards fuming, you will say, fuming furious. If they turn, even by a hair's breadth, towards furious, you will say, furious fuming. But if you have that rarest of gifts, a perfectly balanced mind, you will say, fruminous. So in Deleuze's words, the necessary disjunction is not between fuming and furious, for one may indeed be both at once. Rather, it is between fuming and furious on the one hand, and furious and fuming on the other. One of the reasons that examples like this are interesting for Deleuze is that Carroll's use of this word does not simply play on the relationship between two existing words, but reconstructs the way in which the words themselves are generated in a process of mutual contradistinction. Like the event of aeonic time, or the singularity of zero degrees, the word fruminous is treated as an intensity. It's the threshold at which the two words are distinguished from one another. Deleuze writes that with Carroll, there is, quote, an always mobile nonsense which is expressed in esoteric and in portmanteau words, and which distributes sense on both sides simultaneously. What's of interest to us here is the fact that this process of the distribution of sense is not one that happens through a chronological time. The word fruminous reconstructs the form of the pre-chronological, or aeonic, process of division, which is captured eternally in the constant subdivision of the two sides of the portmanteau. I'm not going to dwell too long on Carroll's work because Deleuze ultimately rejects Carroll as his paradigm in favor of Artaud. So for Deleuze, the problem with Carroll is that the paradoxical language he constructs 
only operates on the surface. For Deleuze, the genesis of experience involves a process of the simultaneous differentiation in which bodies are separated from words, subjects from objects, and past moments from future ones. Carroll's writing deals only with the sense of language and not with the genesis of language through the process that separates it from bodies. His use of nonsense language may reconstruct the temporal form of the genesis of experience, but it does not take part in that process and can therefore never be truly creative in the sense I mentioned at the start. It may recreate the form of the aeonic event, but it does this with a series of words that exist in the extended lived reality of it, which is itself conditioned by chronological time. Instead, Deleuze turns to Artaud, in whose work he recognizes a more genetic and creative activity than in Carol's. The comparison is partic particularly productive because Artaud translated some of Carol's poems and rewrote scenes from Carol's story of Alice in Wonderland. Deleuze writes, quote, we would not give a page of Artaud for all of Carol. Artaud is alone in having been an absolute death in literature. Artaud's writing does more than play with the structure of language. It tears at him. He writes with unpronounceable words that make the reader stutter. His theatre productions are full of verbal tics, splutterings, and screams, especially screams. Deleuze claims that in Artaud's writing we find, quote, a formless, fathomless nonsense, very different from that we previously encountered with the two figures inherent in sense. While Carroll's work deals with the process by which words are separated from one another, Artaud is engaged in the process by which words are separated from bodies. With Artaud, quote, every word is physical and immediately affects the body. The word no longer expresses an attribute of the state of affairs. Its fragments merge with the unbearable sonorous qualities, invade the body where they form a mixture and a new state of affairs. Artaud achieves this corporeal quality in his writing and in his performances through the use of what Deleuze calls breath words and howl words. While Carol's portmanteau separated two words, these breath words and howl words separate out the physical and bodily qualities of the word with the meanings that the word acquires in language. What defines Artaud's method for Deleuze is, quote, its consonantal, guttural, and aspirated overloads, its apostrophes and internal accents, its breaths and its scansions, and its modulations which replace all syllabic or even literal values. It is a question of transforming the word into an action. If Deleuze sees Carroll as a writer dealing with the sense of words and the nonsense of words, in Artaud he finds an artist dealing with the sense of language as a whole. In this way, Artaud's practice is logically, if not chronologically, the precondition and the predecessor for Carroll's style. This reordering of the creative lineage gives some sense to Artaud's claim that Carroll had reached out across time to pillage and plagiarize his own as yet unwritten work. So, just a couple more minutes, um, some concluding remarks concerning the way in which this art can be, and this process of creativity can be thought of as eternal and can take part in the genesis of the world. According to the metaphysical position that Deleuze develops in the logical sense, the chronological ordering of time is not a precondition for experience. It is not the case that we simply experience the world that is already spatially and temporally structured. Crucially, it is also not the case that it is experience which gives structure to the world. Instead, Deleuze will claim that there is a process by which the subject of experience and the object of experience are separated from one another simultaneously, and that it is in this separation that generates both an objective world and a subjective viewpoint on it, and that in this process both are given spatial temporal conditions. In this process of separation, the linear chronological structure of time is generated, as is the separation between words and bodies. So from the viewpoint of the fully individuated subject, experience does seem to be spatially and temporary conditioned, and words do appear to be separated from bodies. And from this perspective, words can refer to states of affairs of bodies, but cannot alter them or take part in their genesis. However, the definitive nature of these separations is what Deleuze would call a transcendental illusion. The very existence of this extended reality presupposes a genetic process, which happens outside of or prior to chronological time. And it is in this genetic process that the separations between the binaries I've just listed occur. In a quote from What is Philosophy, with which I began the presentation, Deleuze and Guattari note that in the case of the material instantiation of the artwork, sensation is given the power to exist and be preserved, quote, in the eternity that coexists with this short duration and that sensation is not realized in the material, that the material passes completely into the sensation. 
The reason that sensation can be eternal within a short duration mirrors the way that the event is the eternal threshold in states of affairs that are constantly changing, and the way in which zero degree centigrade remains eternally fixed, even as a body of water melts or is frozen. To lend eternity to sensation, then, the artwork must sit at this threshold between material and sensation, and allow both to pass into each other. If, instead of simply juxtaposing pre-given forms, the artist takes part in the genetic process by which these forms become distinct, then the work will have the quality of an event in the time of ale. It will not simply be an expression of some content, but will mold both the content and its expression in a single, eternal process of subdivision. Artaud's poems and his theatre are given as one example of this, in which his words do not simply express the state of affairs of bodies, but create new bodies and new words by separating them from one another in a single, violent act. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I believe I am right in saying that there is a reason why we speak of events in the time of video and we speak of experience in the time of COVID. Mm -hmm. But the event really does not, is not predicated on the subject. So when we say, uh, I, I remember a line that we wrote, something about the sensation survives the experience of the subject. Mm -hmm. Therefore, creating sensations is really not passing through the experience of the subject. The subject could be a privileged position to be in the field of forces that the sensation is mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that's true. I think that the event has to a strong technological sense. It's pre-individual in the sense that it is it is in that form of aeonic time that the subject becomes separate, becomes individuated. And so in that sense, the subject is always kind of secondary to the event. I think that's true. Um, and, and that's why, as Elizabeth would sorry to say there, the, the sensation becomes eternal, but what has there is always kind of lent eternity even in a short duration because and prior to the idea of duration, prior to the idea of chronological time. Prior to the subject. Prior to the subject, yes. But prior to it, not in chronological time, prior to it, logically. Here we have something for what time is water and water. It's kind of where the distinction that the subject is is not yet born as it were. So what I like about this notion of creativity, you are saying, why is it going to bring creativity here in time? Because it's duration, which is Give the motor of time of productivity. Mm -hmm. That however you suggested that there is a, a reinvention of the eonic time, mm -hmm. uh, which is the realm of the register of the sensation proper. Yeah. I think it's interesting that it does make that thing between Carol and, and Arto because of the way in which one kind of reconstructs the form of the aeonic event or re tries to reconstruct that form with language. Whereas Arto supposedly his, time, his work in, is involved in that process. In How that is that again? Sorry? How? Yeah, exactly. And, and, that, that, and that, that, that idea of the Howl word, which I thought is very similar in fact to the screams and making paintings, in which there's that genuine kind of separation from of the screen. The, the subject doesn't pre, pre exist the screen, the subject and the screen kind of become distinct in one, in, in one event. Well, that's how I was reading the paintings. I Just about uh, the passage between uh, Carol and Arthur. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the passage is also a passage of the discovery by the laws of the notion of death. In, in the 60s, he thinks a lot about the primitive thoughts and the nature and, and, and so on and so on. And in Arto, he discovers for the first time of the physical uh, uh, body of the, the, the physical and also the, the, the uh, the death, and, and uh, from here he started to, to talk about the body without organs. I don't know if you agree if this passage is correct. Uh, um, I think that's probably true, and, and in a logical sense, the, the idea of the event um, is related to the moment of death. Um, 
because the universal death of the universal death, exactly. So I think that there probably is a link there. Um, I think it's definitely true that there is a very morbid side of logical sense, and it is true that the universe is a real death in that book. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.